6-7-2-93. And again, this is the district court, and it's right next door to where Tri-State used to be before it fled, and now where Scott Lord is operating as a Scott Lord group, right next door in that same block between Main Street and Franklin on Center in Hempstead. Uh, upon the affidavit of Scott Lord, duly sworn to on the 24th day of August 1993 and all of the papers and proceedings heretofore, head, herein. That's the way lawyers talk. Isn't that outrageous? Abuse of the English language. Let the plaintiff show cause before the presiding judge at Civil Part 1 of the 1st District Court of Nassau County to be held at the courthouse located at 99 Main Street, Hempstead, New York on the 26th day of October. 1993 at 9.30 a.m. or as soon thereafter as counsel can be heard. Why an order should not be entered pursuant to CPLR 5015 vacating the default judgment herein on the grounds that the default of the defendant was excusable. Unbelievable. Then pending the hearing and determination of this motion, let the enforcement of the default judgment be stayed by the plaintiff its attorneys or agents, and the sheriff in Nassau County. Sufficient reason appearing therefore, let service of a true copy of the within order to show cause together with the papers upon which it is based upon Bregenstein and Pact Esquires. We'll have to call them up. Uh, they've been the lawyers in several of these judgments against Scott Lord and Tri-State. Uh, attorneys for the plaintiff at 100 Merrick Road, Rockville Center, New York, 11530 by certified mail. Uh, return receipt requested on or before October 14, 1993. And upon the Sheriff of Nassau County by personal delivery at 240 Old Country Road, Mineola, New York, 11500. Remember, that's where they were so appalled at page after page after page after page of Scott Lord judgments. Uh, let this service be deemed good and sufficient service, dated Hempstead, New York, October 13, 1993. Uh, enter Ralph P. Franco. It's nothing but a rubber stamp, uh, judge of the district court. So we'll have to wait and see how Judge Franco uh, rules on this, and then we'll have to go to the clerk, and we'll have to get a copy of it, and then we'll have to read it to you. This is October the 31st, 1993, Sunday. And look, look at all this trick-or-treat, all this stuff. This, and these, and these, and these. We got all this for the kids, and nobody showed up. Uh, the kids are so bad here at uh, 21 Greenridge Avenue in uh, White Plains, New York, that uh, they uh, they don't even ask trick or treat. Uh, they just come in and uh, do their damage. That would be the Walt family, the Alpucci family, and the Larkin family. And already there's an egg at the front door, and there's an egg at the uh, uh, kitchen window, and there's shaving cream on the uh, southwest window. Uh, but that's too bad. What am I going to do with all this candy? I'm not going to eat it because tomorrow is November 1st, uh, and I'm going on a fast, and I'm not going to eat it. I have to give it to you. Uh, November 1st is a terrific setup. Now, you don't get this very often. November 1st is a new day, Monday. November 1st is a new week. November 1st is a new month. And November 1st is a new quarter, all four of them. So you've got to be perfect. You know, I object to this uh, and this trick-or-treating because how I mean, really means All Saints Eve. It's the Eve of All Saints. And you should be doing saintly things instead of devilish things. And I really object to parents uh, passing on this paganism to their children, you know, and this vandalism. It's really ridiculous. I like giving uh, the kids candy, though. I like giving them presents. I really think this whole thing should be given the deep six of Halloween and its paganism and it's devilishness. Speaking of devilishness, we have the decision of Judge Fredman. 
Now, this is really not Judge Fredman's decision. It, of course, is the decision of his law clerk. Let me tell you that judges in the Westchester County Supreme Court have no say. They have no say. They're supposed to be decision makers. They're paid $95,000 a year to enforce the law, but they have no say. Everything in the Westchester County Supreme Court is decided by law clerks. And it's a very bad group of law clerks, or it's a group of bad law clerks. Uh, so I'm going to read you the decision. I won't bother with the first few pages because it just uh, lists uh, the things that have happened that you already know about, how the motion, how the action started with a summons and notice and complaint on negligences. Uh, the uh, decision sounds exactly as though the law clerk read only one side, uh, read one set of papers, and he never seemed to pay any attention to the other side. And boy, did I work hard on that. I worked hard on that for two and a half weeks. But it doesn't make any difference. These decisions are all premeditated. They're all uh, predetermined. They're all going to be decided in the favor of the lawyers and against the pro se's. Uh, they're all going to be decided in favor of the males and against the females. Uh, they're all going to be decided uh, for the establishment and against the individual. So don't ever think you're going to find justice, certainly not in the Westchester County Supreme Court. Uh, plaintiff's opposition does not establish, as she avers, that she does not require the bankruptcy court's permission to sue a trustee appointed to that court in a different form. Wrong, absolutely wrong. Plaintiff, me, showed uh, the court that uh, bankruptcy permission court was not, permit, uh, was not needed, it was not needed, and uh, I gave him a case of that, and that's all you really need is one case law really to disprove the whole thing, that the permission of the bankruptcy court is not needed uh, to sue a trustee. Further, it's against uh, saying that the commit permission of the uh, bankruptcy court is needed to sue uh, a trustee uh, is archaic, because the Federal Tort Claims Act uh, was the act of Congress to give a citizen a chance and a right and an opportunity to sue the king, who happens to be, in this sense, the United States. So it's all wrong. It's against the spirit of the Federal Tort Claims Act that you can't sue a trustee in a bankruptcy, and particularly a trustee who's done negligent things. So this is all wrong. The dismissal motion by the three remaining defendants to base is based upon plaintiff's failure to serve any of them with process pursuant to CPLR uh, Section 308. That's just personal jurisdiction. It's just a cop-out. That shows you that the defendants have no meritorious defense. They cannot face the case on its merits. So they get out by a technicality, personal service, and this law clerk is, his name is uh, Jack Leitner, I think. Uh, this law clerk finds us out there, you know, he's already decided he's going to uh, uh, decide against the plaintiff, so now he's got to find his reason, so he brings up the technicality, never deals with the merits of the case. And so the only thing to do is to go and serve Scott Lord, Jan Stahl, and Jeffrey Burns over again and serve them personally. Uh, have a process server do it, pay him to do it. And so bring it back to court again and see what else the law clerk can find to squirm and wiggle out of this. The plaintiff's request for a default judgment and or summary judgment in her favor against the defendants, Lord Stahl and Barnes, must be denied since as a threshold matter, this court never obtained personal jurisdiction over any of these individuals. In addition, the answer of all these defendants, not only defendants Stahl and Barnes, as plaintiff asserts, is dated April 19, 1993 and was served upon plaintiff on April the 21st, 1993, not April the 26th, 1993. Wrong, 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 wrong. Okay, plaintiff's informal request for relief other than those enumerated in a notice of motion or notice of cross motion are not properly before the court for adjudication. Well, they are. This law clerk is not properly before the court. It is ordered pursuant to CPLR as uh, Sections 308, 312, et cetera, about the personal service, as well as for all the foregoing reasons that both defendant O'Connell's motion and the cross motion of the remaining three defendants, Lord Stahl and Barnes, are granted, while both plaintiff's cross motion and her motion are denied in their entirety. What did I tell you? Okay, anti-female, anti-pro se. 
Uh, the complaint is dismissed as against Defendant O'Connell based upon a lack of subject matter jurisdiction over him. I've gone over that with you. You can sue a trustee in the bankruptcy court. And this decision, as I say, is archaic and is dismissed as against defendants Lord Stahl and Barnes based upon a lack of personal jurisdiction over them effective on the date thereof. There being no other defendants in this lawsuit in this form, plaintiff's entire complaint has now been dismissed. Trella! This constitutes the decision in order of the court. Now this is a lousy decision. It has to be appealed. It has to be taken before the uh, judges of the appellate division. Uh, it's about time that the law clerks and the Westchester County Supreme Court did their work. And their work is to enforce the law, uh, not to come up with things that are so out of date such as this. On uh, Monday night, uh, October the uh, 25th, 1993, uh, Scott Lord called Glendora. And let me see if I can find that recording and play it for you. Two nice spots this week on uh, WNBC TV Channel 4 for Jonathan Jaffa's tires and ABC Tank. Uh, they were really uh, lucked out and they came in on the NFL programs right after the Jets Giants game. And the hot level was very high. Hot HUT is the homes uh, using television. It was very high because uh, it was such a rainy, cold day. People were inside in the game. On the other channel, Channel 2, wasn't interesting at all. Someplace San Francisco and somebody else. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's something else I wanted to tell you. Oh, I have a new telephone. This terrific new telephone. It has a display, and it tells you what number you call, and it has a stopwatch. And it tells you how long the call is, how long you're on the phone. Uh, did I tell you that I'll be editing a chat with Glendora in Long Island? Uh, uh, on Cablevision. I'll be doing the, some editing out there. They're a wonderful company, Cablevision. They really deserve a lot of credit the way they do things. You're really lucky out there to have such a good cable company. And you know, it's the biggest one in the whole world. Did you know that? The biggest single system. TCI, of course, is the largest cable company. Uh, but this is the biggest single system in the whole world, 400,000 subscribers. Uh, was there something else to tell you? Uh, uh, Jeffrey Burns and uh, Jan Stahl uh, will not give me the information that I seek uh, over the telephone. He comes to the phone and in a very surly way uh, he says, put it in writing. Uh, that's what I told him uh, when he called me. But he will not give me the information so I have to find it out uh, through the courts and through the Office of Consumer Affairs. Well, I think that's it. We ought to find you a joke. Did you hear that IBM and Goodyear rubber are going to merge so that they can manufacture a computer that makes snap decisions? This is Glendora, chat with Glendora, and don't you let anybody rip you off. You stand up for your rights. You have them. Keep the courage flaming. Bye-bye. This is what happened with Glendora versus Scott Lord, Jeffrey Bryant's Jan Stahl, and others uh, during the week of October the 25th, 1993.
happen on Glendora versus uh, Gannett Broder uh, for the week of uh, October the 25th, 1993. Uh, I spoke keeping uh, Broder and for the TV program in chapters 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, and 53 are tentatively scheduled uh, to be cable cast in Westchester for the next two months. Uh, tentatively, they will be cable cast in Harrison, Port Chester, and Cablevision. Tentatively, they will not be cable cast in Manhattan. And they are not scheduled for Nassau County. The affirmation in opposition to Kalaji's has been served. Uh, it was served at 3:30 uh, p.m. Uh, GCI is selling for 51 and an eighth. And the room clerk says, "Would you like a room with a tub or a shower?" And the traveler says, "What's the difference?" And the room clerk says, "Well, with the tub, you get a chance to sit down." Two hours today on Broda Monday, uh, October 25th, and we checked the f uh, clerk's files in the district court, and everything there finally is in order. Uh, the computer is in order. The computer lists all of the papers that have been filed. And uh, the uh, reported dispatch endorses Piro and duty. You see, uh, this is why no judge will rule against Gannett. The political boss needs these endorsements, he thinks. It is so political and so crooked and the sanctity of the courts they talk about, but uh, we read for a half hour the files in the log, and Joan says, my boyfriend and I have a strange and wonderful relationship. Uh, Joan says, uh, he's strange and I'm wonderful. Glendora watched the appellate division in White Plains. It was interesting. Miller, Rosenblatt, Ritter, and Thompson, they came up from Brooklyn. They do this twice a year, and the appellate term is going to Goshen. And Judge DiPaolo said to Glendora, they're taxpayers. They deserve to see the process. Uh, and Glendora said to him, yeah, what a guy. A chat with Glendora was on tonight. It was Chapter 45, Gannett Broder. Currently, Chapter 53 is awaiting editing. And there were three telephone calls. On the next page, you will see the first page of the calendar. It was five pages long. Uh, and it was really a longer session than I've seen them do. Here it is. That's the day calendar, the first page of the appellate division, hearing oral arguments in the city of White Plains. Uh, they had that big case about Yonkers. The Yonkers uh, Common Council, the city council, uh, defied the order of Judge Sand. The United States District Court in Manhattan about the housing way back. This case has been going on for a year. And they had, the appellants had four big judges. And boy, let me tell you those uh, judges, excuse me, the appellants had four big lawyers. And let me tell you something that the judges, the four judges, listened very carefully to those four big lawyers. And then over on the other side, on the respondent side, they just had one person. Uh, Bob travels a lot, he's on the road a lot, and he was asked, he says, uh, doesn't that interfere with your message? Your and he was asked, doesn't that interfere with your marriage? And Bob says, no, no, my wife and I have a strict understanding. We write down what it was we were arguing about when I left, and then when I come back, we pick up where we left off. Uh, now, let's see what happened on uh, Broder. On Thursday, Glendora talked to Arthur Ock Salzberger Sr. this morning. He is the owner of the New York Times. He liked the joke of the day. Uh, and I'm reading the laws of service. And uh, Robert said, I just came back from a pleasure trip. And Bill says, where did you go? And Robert says, I just took my mother-in-law to the airport. On Friday, two of us spent an hour in the United States District Clerk's Office. We checked the clerk's file, and everything in it is there that should be. Uh, we asked the secretary if Judge Broderick had everything in his file that he should have, and we listed the things, majorly the summons with notice and complaint, and then my motion for default judgment, and then my affirmation and vehement opposition to the answer, so-called, of Gannett 
and also my affirmation in opposition to Dr. letter asking for a conference. You have to go to page five uh, to find the motion for default judgment. It's good work. And so the computer's up to date and the clerk's file is up to date and apparently uh, the secretary said 99% sure that Judge Broderick's file has everything in it that it should. And Judge Broderick will be away until the third week in November. Brewer has not had a story in the paper since October 18th. Does he still work there? How can management justify the shareholders' money for that? Uh, GCI was at 51 and a half Friday. Uh, why doesn't Gannett answer the motion for default judgment? They have not answered to this very day. Well, why didn't they answer timely the summons with notice and complaint? What have we been saying on TV all along about the management of Gannett? Sydney, I've been on the road six months. John, you must be a slow driver. There's one hour today on Broder on Saturday. Uh, folks, uh, uh, while I was videotaping yesterday's uh, and today's Friday, uh, May the 10th, and I was videotaping yesterday, May the 9th, and around noontime, uh, Ben Wiles called me. Uh, from Albany, and he purports to be the lawyer for the TCI lawbreakers, or some of them, <clears throat> for one that doesn't even exist as a party to the action. But anyhow, you all know that. They're having a whole problem with their appearance. And if they didn't appear, they're in default, and if they're in default, they owe me $350 million, and you and I are all set. Now, here is that conversation. And there are some gaps in it because of technical difficulties in the recording of it. We're doing this in the afternoon sun, Friday, May the 10th, uh, at 6.40 p.m. Isn't it wonderful to have these long days, long daylight? Here we go. Tell you a joke, maybe. Yes. Well, well, well. It won't help. Hang up. If I was disconnected, you can hear the operator. Yes, um, what? Disconnected. If you'd like to make the time is 12:03 p.m. Write it down 390 You can always tell when the boss is going to arrive. His after shave makes it from the parking lot into the office. Good morning, 9:45. This is Ben Wilds.
not, not with my consent it hasn't, and I believe you have to have my consent to do that. I believe you have to have the consent of both parties to do that. And I haven't ever even met Judge Rakoff. And not for all purposes. Uh, maybe. Um, well, uh, you know, I have just, I have motions that can't be handled by a magistrate. Uh, Mr. Chanel? Sure. Uh, I, I got the copy of the uh, reference order, or the referral order. Yes. Uh, and I understand it, it is referred for all purposes. But one, that I have papers from Glendora where she, they're characterized as a motion to reverse one of Judge Fox's orders, his order of uh, May 3rd, 1996. And um, so I, I don't know what the other motions are that Glendora is referring to, but this... Well, you have a copy of them. This uh, it's, uh, Glendora, I, everybody will speak as much as you need. I just to un need to understand what's going on. So. Well, he has been served a copy of them, as you have been. So he knows what the motions are. Let me just finish. So... And Mr. Wolf. This one, the notice of what's characterized as a notice of motion to reverse Judge Fox's order, <clears throat> Judge Fox has already issued an order, so I think this would... Uh, this wouldn't be covered by the reference. This is, in effect, I think, making objecting to the order or seeking a review of the order. I think Mr. Walsh should put this all in writing. Um, if Mr. Walsh wants to object to it, then he should put it in writing. No, I'm not objecting. I, I'm uh, just... Mr. Willis Glendora, I... Mr. Wild. To, well, yeah. I need, uh, sorry, sir. I need to understand what's going on, so I'm taking notes of uh, the conversation, and uh, I will uh, be as helpful as I can. Just um, uh, explain to me one after the other uh, what's going on. My understanding from this conversation is that, uh, Mr. Wild, you're saying that maybe um, Judge Fox issued a report and recommendation and, uh... No, I don't think he did. To that, is that no, no, that is not so. He did not. Mr. Wilde, is how about I, I, how about, or not? Right. Uh, Mr. Judge Fox uh, had a conference on May 3rd. Yeah. Uh, and uh, at the conference, he, uh, he had previously received uh, papers from, from me and from Glendora on an issue that was before him, which was the production of, or the disclosure of the resi personal residence addresses of some of the defendants, or all the defendants. Uh, and uh, he considered that, and he decided what would happen in that case, and he res he uh, put his uh, decision in the record in the transcript. And so it's not really a report and recommendation; it's a decision on a it's a, it's a pretrial uh, you know it's a decision on a pretrial matter. Okay, it's uh, I understand a discovery matter. Yes. So uh, you're saying that Judge Fox has not ruled on disposition motions? Yes, he had. He's he's ruled on this one. The one to uh, whether or not we would have to disclose uh, the personal home addresses. He ruled on that on May 3rd. Mr. Mr. Schimmel, this has to be in writing, okay? We just cannot do it this way. You're not getting the wrong information. Oh, no. Now, let's see how local that is, where it's coming from. It's coming from today, so we have to change that. Pursuant to Judge Rakoff's rules uh, that you have received, um, uh, chambers are not to receive any uh, letter or uh, document unless we specifically ask for it. Uh, the proper way to do that is exactly what you did, ma'am, is to call chambers um, to um, uh, tell me uh, what the matter is, and uh, I will speak to Judge Rakoff about it, and I will get back to both of you. Um, and every time I will speak to one of you, I will speak at the same time to the other. Uh, through That's good. So that nobody has ex parte conversations. That's good because Mr. Wiles ran wild with Judge Connor on ex parte uh, conversations. Decisions were made over the phone and I wasn't even present. All right. So, so this is a good thing. Clear and there uh, will not be any ex parte conversation with anybody. Um, now, are there... Uh, other dispositive motions? Yes, there are. I have several of them. I don't. I think these defendants are in default because I don't think they uh, are represented, and I don't think they've been represented from day one, which would be January 23rd. I can find no appearance sheets anywhere. Uh, and uh, then uh, I had other ones. Now, I don't have those papers in front of me now, so that isn't quite fair to me because I have things to... Uh, I have motions on several counts. All right. Um, so now, ma'am, where these motions uh, sent to 
Judge Rakoff's chambers as well yes, and as to Judge Fox's chambers? Yes, and to Mr. Uh, Wiles, and some of them have been returned by Judge Rakoff. The ones to Judge Fox have not been returned, and Mr. Wiles has received a copy of everything. Right, and uh, uh, the motion papers were uh, returned by our chambers yes. for the reason that I just stated to you. Yes, but I don't quite understand that. If Mr. Wiles gets a copy of them, or why is that ex parte? Um, it's not. Um, there, there are two different things. Um, th there are no ex parte communication with uh, Chambers, but at the same time, um, if you wish to uh, file a, any kind of motion, uh, you need to have a, a conference call with uh, Chambers. Okay. Uh, uh, and, and the court needs to... Uh, Okay, Mr. Wiles. Okay. Um, Mr. Wiles just called me out of the blue. I am unprepared. Uh, a big, I need to have those papers in front of me. Could we all make an appointment for a conference sure, call again? Sure, And um, what day would you to fix the, the uh, time of this appointment? Yes, right now. Uh, what right time? Now. And when uh, we have this uh, conference call, um, uh, I will uh, either let you know whether. Um, the matter has been referred to Judge Fox also uh, uh, for the purpose of ruling on dispensing motions um, or... Uh, uh, um, but Mr. Schiff, you have to have my consent for that. Yeah, I do understand your point, uh, ma'am. Uh, I will uh, ask the court um, uh, how we should proceed on, on this yeah, issue. But first of all, can we have our conference call? What date can we do that before you ask the court anything? Uh, when can we have this conference call when I have the papers in front of me? Just a second, ma'am. I'm going to look at uh, the court's schedule, and I will let you know that. I'm sorry that it takes a... Uh, oh, well, don't uh, worry about that. That's okay. Care, so. That's okay. We could probably have that on Monday at 6.30 p.m. Monday at 6.30 p.m.? Yes. Yeah. Um, um, okay. And, um... Would you give me a moment, please, to get my calendar? Sure. Thank you. Just the way it was to send to Judge Rakoff. 
Right, right. And, and to the clerk and to Judge Brock. The motion, and there are no other motions other than those which you have sent me some papers on. Is that right? Repeat. You know, you don't want to talk in this conference on Monday. You don't want to have a conversation about any motions other than those that you sent me papers on. No comment. All right, the, the phone uh, conference on Monday will uh, address the motions that um, uh, Glendora has uh, filed with, uh, with the court, uh, uh, any motion, and, and the specific uh, issue that uh, will be addressed on Monday, Glendora, um, is uh, whether these motions will be pending before Magistrate Judge Fox or before this court. No, I do no, understand. no, that's something okay. altogether new to me. This is the first time you've hit me with that. Okay. Uh, I, I say the whole thing about Judge Fox uh, is that this has been done without my knowledge. If it has been done, and I don't know what has been done, and uh, no, uh, if you want to put me uh, something in writing in preparation for the Monday conference and going to Judge Fox, that's different. But uh, uh, we, 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 uh, that has just been dropped in my lap, just this minute, by you. Okay. Um, the purpose of the um, conference call on Monday will be to determine um, whether uh, the motions uh, that you wish to make um, will be pending before Judge Fox. No, I, no, I never, I never asked for that. Well, this is, this is. Uh, no, I'm not prepared to do that. I'm prepared to talk about my motions that I submitted at least two weeks ago. Yeah, but... But now, this Judge Fox thing is all brand new to me, and, and I'm not prepared to talk about that Monday. But this is, uh... You, you have given me nothing in writing. Uh, I only, uh, two or three days ago, uh, got your letter of reference to Judge Fox. I didn't even know that. Um, and everybody seemed to know that before the plaintiff did. So... So, no, uh, this thing about going before Judge Fox, I want preparation, and I'm not prepared to talk about that Monday um, until I see something from you, your proposal, in writing. Ma'am, uh, Chambers will not uh, write anything else before the next phone conference with you. Okay, then we're not talking about reference to Judge um, Fox. If you want to do it at some other point, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do the Judge Fox reference at some other point after you have informed me what you have in mind. Uh, Glendora, the, what we are going to discuss at the next phone conference is um, whether the motions are going to be pending before Judge Fox. Or no, we aren't. No, no, that's a bomb. Finished, uh, I'm that's a bomb that you just dropped to me now. Yeah, but... And I'm in the middle of uh, videotaping my program. Yeah. We're here to talk about the motions, but not about me dumping me onto Judge Fox. Uh, I have to have that in writing, and I have to have something and know what you're saying uh, and what you're prepared to do. I have uh, to see something in writing. You received uh, this court's individual rules of practice. Now, look, Mr. Schimmel. I am not going to be railroaded. I have to see something. I have to see something. I have to. Don't change the subject, please. I have to see something in writing. And I am not prepared. I am not prepared to talk about uh, this uh, rake off, copping out, and dumping me on Judge Fox. I'm not prepared to talk about that money because you have given me nothing in writing. Okay. I am not prepared um, to talk about that Monday. My understanding, ma'am, is that. Um, this case has been referred to Mattresses Fox. For discovery. Can you let me talk? For discovery. Yes, no, what? no, I have to go, Mr. Shummel. Okay, I have to go. That's what the conference call was about, is about much. You're bringing in a brand new thing, and you're bringing it in without any record. And I have had enough of that with Judge Connor. I want a record. I want something to hold in my hand and a statement from you. You're not going to railroad me. Ma'am, on Monday... Or um, on another day. Yes, on another day, maybe. Ma'am, well... But not on Monday, until you give me something in writing. Well, uh, Mr. Wells. This is Mr. Wells. Um, um, what I've received here is a copy of uh, uh, the original...
original uh, reassignment order, uh, which established Judge Rakoff as the judge on the case. Yeah. Uh, and attached to that were the individual uh, rules of, uh, I think they're called rules of practice, right? Yeah. Individual rules of practice. Uh, and uh, I also received a copy of uh, Judge Rakoff, Rakoff's order, uh, in which he, uh, I think, expanded or put his own order on the reference to the magistrate. Well, I have both of those. I don't think there's anything else in writing other than things I've gotten from right. or I've got most of the order of reference is for all purposes? Yes. Okay. Uh, no, it's a reference to, uh, wait a minute. It makes reference to... Okay, folks, that's the end of the tape. Uh, what happened after that? Uh, well, I just pointed out that uh, it's the law. Reference to a magistrate judge is purely voluntary. Okay, They have to have my consent. I am entitled to a United States district judge, and so this bothered me all night long, and this morning, I think I got up at something like 4 a.m., and I wrote out my objection. Now, there's no good to write out your objection because Judge Rakoff will not accept correspondence. So let me read you the, uh, my position on that even though it can't be sent to Judge Rakoff. It really seems to me that a judge has the more a judge knows, the better it is, not the less he knows. Just a second. So here is a letter. It can't go anywhere because of the blackout in uh, Judge Rakoff chambers. Mr. Schimmel, law clerk for Judge Rakoff, United States District Court, Southern District of New York, 300 Quaropa Street, White Plains, New York, 10601, regarding Glendora versus John C. Malone et al., 96 Civ 0140 JSR. Dear Mr. Schimmel, Glendora was busy videotaping her program May 9, 1996, Thursday at noon under deadline to get all the reports done by 3 p.m. when she edits the program 4 to 7 p.m. and then Ben Wiles telephones her. If Mr. Wiles would stay off the telephone, as in so many uh, offenses with Judge Connor, and put things in writing, Glendora's due process would not be violated so often in this case. Mr. Wiles wanted to discuss Glendora's motion to Judge Rakoff to reverse Judge Fox's order denying home addresses. Judge Connor gave her February the 28th, 1996 which Judge Connor didn't keep his word on and which Judge Fox didn't keep his word on to enforce it. Pressed for time, Glendora decided to call you to the telephone conference method Judge Rakoff mandates. The motion to reverse Glendora was prepared to discuss, but not all the other motions. She had no time to get all the papers out of the file drawers and study them, and she had to get the videotaping done in time to edit the TV show. Uh, she certainly wasn't prepared to discuss the bomb you announced that Judge Rakoff was dumping her case onto Judge Fox, U.S. Magistrate, for everything, including trial. Your saying so was her first realization of same. Here, Glendora was looking forward to her new judge, and already it is turning sour the way it did with Judge Connor. Judge Rakoff returns papers instead of meeting justice. There are no submissions on paper. There are no conferences in the courtroom. How do the raging disputes get resolved? What is a judge for? This is failure to exercise decision-making authority which undid Judge Cattell in 1994. The local rules under, quote, magistrates, unquote, I can't find mine. I must have left it at the U.S. Court of Appeals Wednesday. But at the bottom of the second page, right-hand side, it says, only by consent. Glendora does not consent. Glendora is vigorously opposed. Glendora applied in March for Judge Fox to recuse himself. He would not. It was a refuse to recuse. You're saying yesterday that Judge Fox had possibly issued a report and recommendation was a disappointment to Glendora, that you are not fully aware of the facts and circumstances. This means a lot of reading has to be done and that papers submitted have to be read instead of returned. Here are some of what Glendora's pro se manual says about magistrates. The decision to consent to the referral of an entire case to a United States magistrate judge for disposition is entirely voluntary. All parties to the case must consent to the reference and the district judge assigned to the case must approve the referral. If consent is obtained, the magistrate judge then presides over the action 
to its disposition when he, she will order entry of a final judgment. If a party is not satisfied with the decision rendered by the magistrate judge, the decision may be appealed. First one, 28 U.S. Code, Section 636C3, an appeal from a judgment rendered by a magistrate judge may be taken directly to the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit. Alternatively, upon consent of all parties under 28 U.S.C. 636C4, an appeal may be taken to the district court. In order to utilize the option of proceeding before a United States Magistrate Judge, a consent form titled, quote, consent to proceed before a United States Magistrate Judge, unquote, must be completed. This form is available from the Pro Se Office after the form is completed and signed by all parties from whom consent is required. It must be returned to the Pro Se Office with an affirmation of service. Now, to send a reference order, Glendora says, for all purposes, was not an experienced move. Glendora has a right to have a United States District Judge. As Glendora has watched the decisions of Judge Fox since 1993, they have been in favor of big business, not in favor of little people. Not accepting telephone calls unless both parties are on the line is an excellent standard. Ben Wiles manipulated Judge Connor on about eight decisions, made ex party over the phone without Glendora's being heard. Extend the time to answer uh, 20 days instead of granting default judgment, backing down on the order for home addresses, turning it over to Judge Fox, uh, robbing Glendora of 10 defendants, taking jurisdiction of the case away from the United States Court of Appeals, and others listed in papers submitted to you earlier this week. Glendora was severely damaged, prejudiced by these denials of her due process by Mr. Wiles and Judge Connor. This is what precipitated Judge Connor saying, I'm a senior judge. Now look, Glendora, I don't have to stay on this case if I don't want to. I can get off this case if I want to. Do you want me to get off this case and let one of the other judges handle it? Glendora, yes. Judge Connor, very well then. I'm off the case. Thank you. This is the report Glendora was giving on TV that Malone Magnus TCI uh, censored April the 30th, 1996, 9.08 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. by turning off the audio. Glendora asks that the court bear in mind that she edits her TV program Wednesday afternoons and videotapes and edits all day Thursday, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. Editing time loss cannot be retrieved, and Glendora's program is a news program. It is a week in review and has to be ready to distribute by Friday. This is page 6, the last page. Plaintiff reminds his court of pro se leniency in that this is a civil rights case. The telephone conferences have distinctive values. Their disadvantage is nothing in writing. And if Glendora makes a motion that is turned down over the telephone and she wants to appeal it, where is the order to appeal from? And the judge can't see it in Larchmont. Judge Rakoff cannot see it in Larchmont anymore because Malone, Magnus, TCI et al. robbed him and Glendora and all the public of public access on April 30th, 1996, while the court stood idly by. Another disadvantage with accepting no correspondence, everybody else knows what's going on except the judge. The judge should know as much as he can, not as little. Yours in truth, Glendora, two hours of chat with Glendora and so forth, copy to Ben Wiles. I must tell you that my uh, Lawsuit Glendora versus Telecommunications Incorporated. Uh, this is the censorship case of censoring the program on the night of April 30th, 1996. Uh, that that has not gone before a judge yet. It does not have a docket number. And the I inform apocryphal has not been approved yet. I found that out from the pro se clerks today. I am happy, 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 happy to report to you that I was able to do the TCI filing for the last two weeks uh, from April the 26th uh, to today, uh, May the 10th. And uh, these, I was able to uh, paginate. And uh, these are the papers that were pulled out. And these eight and a half by 11 papers 
were reduced today uh, at Office Max by Franklin, and it took an hour and three quarters, and it cost three dollars. And I'll show you the cute little pages that he reduced them to. He did them so neatly. These. Now I will have to take these and. My copy machines is the best for this, is to make masters of these so that you come out with four on a sheet, four pages on a sheet, to hold down the printing costs and hold down the postage. And it doesn't really include the most recent paper you just heard read. Now, the report on how many pages? Okay. PCI's bad record is up to... 4,900 pages. That's almost 5,000. Volumes of bad record is uh, 13 volumes. I haven't had time to add up the uh, number of hours they have cost us of our lives. And I haven't had time to add up the expenses and uh, how much uh, many hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal labor. Not hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands. So I have to report to you on uh, that next week. Uh, here are some points that uh, I don't think the Court of Appeals has the entire record on appeal for TCI. I've got to go down and investigate that further in Manhattan. Uh, the situation in the state court is that you have to belong to the old boys club in order to win anything, uh, and that you can't be a pro se and win anything. And The appellate division, second department, is so bad uh, that they really should warn people, you know, don't bring lawsuits here because we're, we're not going to do our job. Uh, we're going to rule on what's best for us, and we're going to rule on what's best for our political connection. So they really should put up a warning, you know, the way you have on cigarette packages. This is uh, dangerous for your health. So the next page is 4,911. Uh, let's see what other thoughts are jotted down here for you. The file is in order up to May the 10th, 1996, Friday, today, and that was at 7.44 a.m. And Franklin says that uh, all the judges go off in opposite directions. Uh, you don't have really any standards, you know. Uh, every judge, it's too much personality is what it is. There's too much personal stuff in a judge's decision. There, it isn't scientific. It isn't uh, uh, exact enough, you know. One judge will rule on the same issue. One judge, well, you take 14 judges, they'll all rule 14 different ways. And Glendora wants Ben Nut Wiles to know this, that anything addressed to Glendora Buell, even if it's also addressed to Glendora, will be refused because Glendora Buell is not a party to the action. And then he will be in default with his paper. What remains to be done on uh, TCI is to add up the hours, add up the dollars, uh, to read that uh, uh, third batch of uh, discovery papers that I demanded and a lot that I didn't demand and not and missing some that I uh, did demand and, uh, and they're not there. So to read that and to get out this mailing and I, then I believe if nothing comes in the post office box tomorrow on Sunday uh, that uh, TCI will be up to date. Is that everything? And then Monday at 6.30 will be that conference and I'll tell you all about that next week to stop for jokes, that's good for our souls.
I was telling you that the, uh, Peter said the airlines I flew on the uh, other day did not have in-flight movies, but that was okay because every now and then your lives flash before your eyes. Uh, you know what really bothers me about airlines? Charlie says I can't afford to fly to Paris, Rome, Hong Kong, but my luggage has been to all three. And they couldn't afford in-flight movies and so the pilot flew low over the drive-in theaters. Uh, as much as I love my dear friends, the clerks in the United States District, District Court in White Plains, I've got to write the boss, Mr. Parkinson. And I got to tell him that they make errors. We all make errors. But I've told him about these errors three and four and five and six times, and they're still in the record. And then when you ask them to change them, they come up with the craziest excuses. Uh, like, uh, well, we don't have the record. It's down in the Court of Appeals. Well, you have it on the computer. Change it on the computer. Uh, for instance, they have down that the cause of action for Glendora versus Cablevision is prisoner civil rights, 1983. I've never been a prisoner in my life. I've never broken a law. I've never been involved with, a, with uh, people versus, or the United States versus, never. And I could sue them for that. Damage to my reputation. Now, instead of putting down prisoner civil rights, and I told them this several times, they put down civil rights. It's a civil rights case. So Mr. Parkinson, we've got to do something with these people. I told him uh, yesterday uh, that uh, Rudolph is not a defendant in Glendora versus Cablevision. The name is Randolph. And they start off the uh, uh, case with saying Glendora versus Cablevision Systems Corporation, Cablevision Systems Corporation. I'm only versing one cable systems corporation, and there is only one. It's simple enough to take that out, but they've got to give you an argument. So I guess I'll have to appeal to the head honcho, Mr. George Parkinson. Franklin and I got dressed up this morning at 8 o'clock, and at quarter to 9, we left for the uh, Supreme Court, state of New York, county of Westchester, 19 floors of injustice. And uh, we waited for Judge Silverman. We went to his courtroom. We saw a lot of people we knew. It was fun to see them all again. We told a lot of jokes. And uh, Judge Silverman was supposed to be in the courtroom at 9.30 a.m. He didn't get there until 9.51 a.m. Uh, he was talking. There was one case I wanted to see. It was Pirro versus Woodlands. Now that Pirro is Janine Pirro's husband, I believe. And Woodlands, uh, we don't want anything to happen to Woodlands. So, but what happened there at that case was that a one lone lawyer came and he said that he was there to tell them that a settlement is in process and the settlement should be announced either uh, next week or the week after. Uh, and a lawyer gave a reason why he couldn't have the discovery ready and Silverman said that's a lousy excuse. And uh, Judge Silverman was talking about c coming back on June 25th and that there wouldn't be any decision until September. Now this is May, early May, and that he and his law clerk will be on vacation uh, the entire month of August. And so nothing would be done up through the end of July and it won't be picked up for 30 days to be even looked at. Uh, and he said, we look at the papers all at the same time, both sides, all at the same time. Somebody mentioned he had a case before Judge Kahn on a certain day and couldn't be there. That's Judge Kahn, the one who did such a terrible job on uh, the case against the Commission on Judicial Conduct, which is a sham. And another case, uh, 
Judge Silverman, oh yeah, you refresh my memory. How did trustees become executors? And the uh, lawyers answered, well, we did away with all of the trustees. So the executors became trustees. Uh, Judge Silverman, when he'd finished all the cases and the courtroom was almost empty, he said, does anybody else have anything to bring toward me? And I believe he was addressing myself. And uh, then another man said something, and another man said, and then everybody was out, and there was only Judge Silverman left, Franklin and myself. <coughs> and uh, he says, you have anything to bring before me? And I said, no. I said, this is the return date, May 10th. And I once did not appear on a return date, and it was bad. And so I don't take chances anymore. When I hear a return date, even if everything's on submission, I go. And I said, uh, he said, all right. And I said, I don't want those contracts. He says, okay. He says, tell the other side. He says, I'm sure they won't bother. And that was it. As I say, we told lots of jokes. Today, uh, the work is all piled up. There's papers to write. Uh, there's file paginate and log and mail for Continental, file paginate and log and mail for Cablevision. Uh, and, uh, but I did sit down and do some very important telephoning today. And now I have an, a Nassau County address in Huntington Station. Well, it's actually South Suffolk, but it is in the coverage area. And uh, of uh, what they call the Long Island Woodbury system. And so that's good. Uh, there's still a big question about TCI's appearance. Uh, I don't think they have appeared. I do think they are in default. And I do think that we have $350 million coming to us. Uh, so I talked to the United States Court of Appeals. I talked to the Per Se Clerk. I talked to uh, uh, LTV way out on the end of Long Island on the Southern Fork. Uh, I talked to several people in Nassau County and in Suffolk County. Uh, so I was able to do 18 operations to keep this going. Folks, uh, this completes the report uh, from uh, May the 2nd to today, May the 10th, 1996, Friday night at 7.40 p.m. Uh, and we'll have you three jokes and then the Bible passage. If you look like your passport photo, folks, you're not well enough to travel. And the popularity of antiques is really something right now. There are 25 million Americans who have things that are old, funny looking, don't work, and are kept around for sentimental purposes. They're called antiques or they're called husbands. And the tour guide says, this building has been here for over 300 years. Not a stone has been touched. Nothing has changed. Nothing has been replaced. And the tourist says, they must have the same landlord we do. My husband and I are celebrating our 10th anniversary, Diane said, seven years of eating out of cans. Remember this about all persons who do you, uh, who take away your rights, that every one of us, and that includes judges, so then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. That's Romans 14, 12. And God bless you all. A press announcement for you. The Center for Judicial Accountability, a national nonprofit, nonpartisan citizens organization working to reform the processes of judicial selection and discipline, supports Bill Number 7484 on today's agenda of the Senate Judiciary Committee. The bill, designed to give the public greater knowledge about the workings of the system and instill greater public confidence in the process of disciplining judges, marks the first step in opening to the public the now confidential proceedings of the New York State Commission on Judicial Conduct. 
It would require that once the commission institutes disciplinary proceedings against a judge, the hearings be public. Everybody else's are, and the same applies to lawyers. However, the Senate's position is that this bill does not go far enough. Only the smallest percentage of complaints filed with a commission each year result in disciplinary proceedings against a judge. Last year, out of more than 1,400 new complaints, the commission commenced uh, disciplinary proceedings against only 19 judges. Well, ah, that's right. The commission justifies these minuscule numbers by claiming that the vast majority of the complaints it receives, which it dumps without investigation, are frivolous or do not constitute misconduct. Oh, yeah. Old Boys Club. It is able to maintain this pretense because these complaints are statutorily confidential, which means the commission can say whatever it wants about the complaints without anyone, including legislators, being able to verify the true facts. The bill does nothing to remove the convention the confidentiality surrounding these complaints against judges, which overwhelmingly never reach the investigative stage. Okay, I'll read you more next week. Uh, this finishes uh, the book today on the uh, second department, Appellate Division, Supreme Court of the State of New York. And these are the last three judges. And this was uh, Gabriel Kraussman, New York Law School, member of Law Review, first in his graduating class, Brooklyn College, an honors graduate of New York University, judge of the Civil Court of the City of New York, which is one of the worst courts there is in 1980, Supreme Court bench for the second judicial district in 83. You know how bad Supreme Courts are. He was served as a justice of the appellate division, second department, since 1994. I remember when he was appointed and he's a veteran of the Korean War. That's the only thing that he did any good. Maria Goldstein, 56. Many of them went to the Brooklyn Law School. Editor of the Law Review, highest scholastic average in the graduating class. Judge of the Civil Court for the City of New York. Acting Judge of the Criminal Court for the City of New York. Supreme Court Justice for the Second Judicial District. They all follow in the same footsteps. Supreme Court for the Second Judicial District. This is a carbon copy of Judge Kraus uh, Krausman. Justice for the Appellate Division since 1994. I remember when she was appointed. This is the last one. And the reason they have to keep appointing justices for the Supreme Court, I mean the appellate division, is that we have so many bad justices in the uh, Supreme Court, Westchester County. Anita, graduate from Manhattanville College, 58, Fordham College School of Law, Fordham University School of Law, uh, assistant district, uh, New York Deputy Secretary of State. Judge of the Criminal Court of the City of New York, Acting Justice of the Supreme Court, 12th Judicial District, uh, Supreme Court for the 12th Judicial District, and as a Justice of the Appellate Division, and I remember when she was appointed in 94. President of the Bronx County Bar Association, Metropolitan Women's Bar Association, and the New York State Association of Women Judges. Okay, this is the end of this book, and I'm glad to say I'm not going to read any more to you. Here are all of the bad judges, all in a row. And you've never seen any more injustice come out of anyone than out of the Appellate Division, Second Department, Supreme Court of the State of New York. Uh, it's the worst court we have. 
and it makes all of the other courts bad. If we had a good appellate division second department that was honest and honorable and had a backbone and stood up for right, we'd have good courts other places. Their conclusion is, we celebrate our first centennial and approach the 21st century with many of the same hopes and aspirations that were held in 1896. The only hope and aspiration I have is honor, honesty, and justice. An optimistic outlook that our citizens will continue to have recourse to an appellate tribunal that is firmly grounded in traditions of justice and equity and in an abiding faith in the preeminence of the rule of law. What a lie. They never rule on the law. They never rule on the facts. They just rule on the basis if they like you or not or if you have a political connection or if it's going to do them good politically. That's how they rule. They rule on what is best for them. Our hopes are buoyed by the experience of the last 100 years in which countless thousands of people, rich and poor, have had their disputes resolved. Yes, resolved in the favor of the judges. Not by bloodshed or violence, and I'm not sure that the appellate division beats bloodshed and violence, but under our open portals in a setting de designed to promote tranquility, justice, and fairness. They know nothing about all three. The appellate division, second department, Supreme Court of the State of New York. Uh, Shockner, Clark, Redman, Judge, and Blind. Even I'm going to the issue is archaic. Tort Claims Act. Uh, turn their facts. The act that gave up the fence. Are the king can't sue the king? It's over with. It's have the federal claim, you can sue the United States, be the defendant, and you can sue the United States. The public has a right known for so long. Supreme Court. No in the West County Supreme Court. Glendora never gets her day in court. Justice herself never gets her day in court. This is a court where its administrative judge has gone on record in the Gannett newspapers anti the court's prejudices. There is no but she is not the court that stands up for over the honest, hard working for the parasites of society from the wrongs. It is a shameful record. You are made more and more, and all this wisdom both today.
And all of this was through Glendora's mind as she stood in the voting booth Tuesday and refused to pull the letter for Judge Bryan. Each election, she can refuse to pull the letter for the duly derelict judge in Westchester Supreme Court. The feds have a pro se clerk. Why doesn't the Supreme Court? You want to know why? The Supreme Court loathes, abhors, hates, detests, and despises pro ses. The Supreme Court doesn't seem to understand the United States Constitution that Glendora has every right to defend herself and should not be denied that right. The feds do. They do understand that. Maybe Glendora should bring an action against all of these judges and law clerks in Westchester Supreme Court on civil rights, denial of her constitutional right to represent herself, denial of a fair tribunal. Yes. Bring this action against all these Supreme Court judges and their lawyers in the United States District Court, Southern District, White Plains Branch. Make this one of their first class, make this one of their first cases in their new United States Courthouse on Lexington and Quaropus in White Plains. It will be opening a year from today, November 1994. The feds charge only $120 to get a judge and an index number, not $245 as the Westchester Supreme Court charges. The federal clerk in her papers even addresses her instructions to counsel and to pro se litigants. It looks like the Westchester Supreme Court is a little behind the times. It is, no wonder, the appellate division second department is two years behind. They have so many appeals of judges' bad decisions in Westchester County Supreme Court. Judge Fredman never answered Glendora's request for a conference. It is a hollow performance, folks. It rattles with decadence. Nowhere does Fredman law clerk Jack Shackner deal with the issue, negligences. He just goes around and around the perimeter ad infinitum. What is going on in their tombstones? Cut. What is going on in their tombstones? Did they stand up for right? Did they protect the victims? Or did they condone their jobs? Did they answer their calling? These decisions do not have to be made in black robes. They can be made in their underwear. Why are they always on the side of the liar, the thief, the cheat? Think about it. The answer is obvious. With her TV show, Glendora has done more to show these up than any judges in Westchester Supreme Court ever have. This decision is as bad as the first two Fredman's law clerk made, and that is a horrible record. O'Connell had the same service as Lord, Stahl, and Barnes, but the law clerk goes on making a decision on O'Connell's motion. It is a, such a sham. It is such a masquerade. This decision is stacked, rigged, premeditated, predetermined, contrived, and artificial. These law clerks just see one side, their own side. They do what is best for themselves. They never read the side they don't like, let alone apply the law, let alone deal with the issue. The worst job in the world has to be a law clerk or a judge. And along with this is their unbearable arrogance. The epitome of law clerks' arrogance is Janine Pirro's law clerk, the six-foot bald one. He struts around like a peacock, except he has no feathers. Justice is blind? No, deaf, dumb, and blind. Oh, and today's joke, other than what you have just read, Mary, did you have a hard day in the courthouse, dear? Peter, yes, the computer broke down and I had to think. This ends what happened with Glendora versus Scott Lord, Jan Stahl, Jeffrey Barnes, and others. On uh, what happened the week of November the 1st, 1993. On November the 1st, 1993, this is a lineup. You have a new day, a new week, a new month, and a new quarter. It's not very often that you get that. So in celebration of that, I fasted all day. Went to the Bronx. We picked up a check from a client who's going to go on WNBC TV. And our, uh, Broder had an article in the newspaper, what do you know? It was about people. Uh, having their backs rubbed. Uh, and then uh, on Tuesday election day, we voted and we started working on the Form 18A that uh, Kalaji is crying about uh, the defendants didn't get. 
Uh, he's trying to delay it because he doesn't have a case against the antitrust charge. Uh, and so uh, we're going to uh, serve the summons with notice and the complaint over again. And this time we're going to put in the form 18A, and I'll show you that in a minute. And uh, the, uh, how did you like the elections? Del Vecchio is out. So Amicone is going to be out. Uh, now, uh, we got the form for the 18A, and we made the copies of it, and we addressed the inside envelopes, and we addressed the uh, outside envelopes. We went down to the district court, and we saw the clerks, and we told them all about it. And we talked to the pro se clerk, and so uh, that's going to be served. And on Tuesday night, a chat with Glendora was on television, and we got the call again from that Broder accomplice uh, who uses such foul language. I would play you uh, what he says on our recorder, uh, except that he shouldn't be on television. Uh, now, action news, that's good. Cable television had it long before Gannett did, but it is nice to read it. Week, practically somebody calls up from Gannett asking us to subscribe. Uh, you tell them over and over, but they keep calling you and they keep on calling. They have a very, very bad list uh, for their telemarketing. They should have a better list. A Fortune 500 company is going to make jokes on the NBC television network. The check is scheduled to go out this week. And uh, Peter said he used to work for the New York Times. I said yes, but they took his paper route away from him. The time on Broder today was a quarter of an hour. On Friday, Glendora called the pro se clerk, and he said Glendora has to sign the form 18A, not the process server. So Glendora signed all 24 forms 18A, and now we'll see what the baby games Kalaji can play with that instead of getting down to the issue, which is antitrust. Glendora goes to Manhattan to edit Broder chapters 52 and 53. It costs $50 an hour, and the videotapes cost $10 per half hour. Predict the time on Broder today is eight and a half hours. Well, that never happened. We never got to the Broder tape. We'll have to do those on Thursday of next week. On, uh, on Friday, uh, we uh, sent out the Form 18A with all those green cards and all of those receipts. It took, uh, you know, a couple of hours to do all this. You have to make out all the certified receipts, and you have to make out all the green cards. We sent them out, and the cost on that, the postage cost on that, was something like $30, $3.44 for each one sent to seven defendants. It is so obvious what Gannett is doing and so pathetic. It is as pitiful as the stuff that Britain tried to pull off. You remember that. Glendora watched Judge Swartzborg for an hour in bankruptcy court, and he was very good. And for seven hours, Glendora edited videotapes in Manhattan, but we never got to ones. We hope to bring uh, Broder up to date Thursday editing day in Westchester. Broder was uh, not on TV last night in Nassau. Nassau is where Broder comes from. Uh, we pasted up the certified mail receipts, and now I'm the total time on Broder this week was 21 hours. I'm going to show you one of these uh, Form 18A that we sent out. Basics. Remember that? Remember that? The other uh, voter lawsuits. Making the basics. That's Gannett's whole problem. Now here's the same. Oh. Uh, long time. And I can tell you exactly what. It was August 9th. Okay, and Gannett is trying to get out of it. And so they say that we didn't send them Form 18A. So we're sending them Form 18A. And here's my cover. <laughs> Look at it. It's by three people. By the clerk of the court, by uh, uh, Judge Roderick Chambers. Uh, this summons with notice and complaint are being served a second time with Form 18A to see if these defendants will sign the PC issue and uh, White Point, New York, dated November 5th. And those are the return, the uh, certified mail receipts. And I wanted to show you this Form 18A. It's really so d ridiculous. So we're forcing them to get down to facing the issue, which is antitrust. This is United States Court, District Court, Southern District of New York, Glendora versus Gannett Company Incorporated, Gannett Suburban Newspaper, John Curley, Gary Watson, Douglas McCorkendale, Gary Sherlock, and Kenneth Paulson, defendants. And case number 93, Civ, Civil, 
5561, notice and acknowledgement of receipt of summons and complaint. And this is the notice. And you take each one, this is before Judge Vincent Byron, to the next company incorporated, the first defendant. The enclosed summons and complaint are served first one through Rule 4C2C2, the Federal Rules. You must complete the acknowledgement part of this form and return one copy of the completed form to the center within 20 days. You must sign and date the acknowledgement. If you do not complete and return the form to the sender within 20 days, you or the party on behalf on whose behalf you are being served may be required to pay any expenses incurred in serving a summons and complaint in any other manner permitted by law. That would be probably personal service in persona. That would be where you hand it to the uh, person personally, and you'd have to have a process server do that, and the cost of that would be something like $45 per defendant. Now, if you do not complete and return the form, you must answer the complaint within 20 days. If you fail to do so, judgment by default will be taken against you for the relief demanded in this complaint, and that's $600,000. I declare under penalty of perjury that this notice and acknowledgement of receipt of summons and complaint will have been mailed on November the 5th, 1993, Glendora. And then their part of it is down here. They have to fill in this part. Acknowledgement of receipt of summons and complaint. I declare under penalty of perjury that I received a copy of the summons and of the complaint in the above captioned matter. And then who will have to sign this would be Gannett Company Incorporated. We had to send out seven different ones. Gannett Suburban Newspaper. John Curley will have to sign his. Gary Watson will have to sign his. Douglas McCorkendale will have to sign his. And Gary Sherlock will have to sign his. And Kenneth Paulson will have to sign his. So Charles Bragan, he used to work for the New York Times. And his mother-in-law says, yeah, but they took his paper route away from him. This is Glendora, chat with Glendora, and this is what happened on uh, Glendora versus Gannett Broder on 1993. And keep your courage flaming. And remember, don't you flunk the basics. Pandora versus the uh, DCF, uh, Judge Capone deciding uh, the week of uh, November 1st, 1993, we went to the county clerk's office to look at the file to find a copy of the order that Judge Capone finally signed. Uh, he signed my order. He didn't sign the DHCR's order. But we thank him for that. Uh, but we went to the county clerk's office to find the file. No file. It was missing. Nobody knew where. Uh, I called the uh, uh, office downstairs on the 12th floor and asked for Michael Riley, who is the court clerk, and he's on vacation. I called upstairs to the chambers, and, Jean, uh, and I asked for Jeanette. She's the secretary. She took the day off. This is Monday, the day before election. They're going to loaf Tuesday. Isn't that enough? They've got to take other days off? So she was gone, and I let it know, be known uh, what I thought of that. Uh, this is in addition to uh, their having received uh, my report on Monday uh, of what I thought of their performance and what I think of the DHCR. It's that long log, uh, you know, that I keep every day and that I read to you, and that was sent out to them. I think that had a whole lot to do with the decision. Immediately, practically, the next day, I get a decision. And it's a very, very bad decision, and it's done very badly. Well, uh, so I will read that to you, and uh, I will write my protest to it. This, okay, I sent them something like 40 pages. I researched this thing for uh, two weeks. It took me two weeks to write uh, my motion, uh, and uh, this is what they returned to me. Can you believe this? This is all just what it was, and this is their decision. Listen to this. Uh, there's nothing here up here. It says the notice of motion, order to show cause, affidavits, notice of cross motion. It doesn't even mention here that they uh, read my summons with notice and my complaint. How are they going to make a decision if they don't read my complaint? Maybe they did. Uh, 
Upon the foregoing papers, it is ordered that this motion is granted. That would be Sanders, the uh, Robert Abrams Assistant Attorney General, is granted. They're going to grant uh, Sanders and uh, Robert Abrams, and they're going to dismiss my cross motion. They denied it. The complaint is dismissed as to the state defendants. The complaint fails to set forth a legally cognizable claim sounding in negligence against the moving defendants. And I only gave them you know, a whole list of negligences. Moreover, this court la and all the exhibits showing that. Maybe they didn't even read them. Maybe they didn't even read my side. Moreover, this court lacks subject matter jurisdiction to award money damages against these defendants. The court of claims is the appropriate forum. Therefore, and I gave them an argument that this is not true. This is not so. People sue the DHCR almost every day, every week, and get paid by the uh, Supreme Court. I'm going to uh, read to you next week uh, what I think of this decision. I'm just telling you this week that I think that because of what I said about Jeanette taking off Monday, and because of the report that I sent out about the DHCR and about how bad Judge Capola's performance was, he had an order before him to sign August 23rd. He never signed it until October 25th and how about how bad his first decision was. I think that this was whipped out as a vendetta. And I think very often that's how things are decided in the Westchester County Supreme Court. Now, why should they have election day off? It takes 10 minutes to vote, doesn't it? It takes 10 minutes to vote. Why do you need all day to go and vote? You don't. It's just an excuse to be lazy. Now, on Wednesday, guess what? The county clerk still hadn't found the Capola Glendora DHCR file. This is the first DHCR, not William Street. And guess what? Jeanette Capola's secretary never took the envelope out that Glendora provided for her to send me a copy of Judge Capola's signed order. I provided my envelope, self-addressed stamped envelope, and she was supposed to send me a copy of that signed order. And she never did. You know what she did instead? She sent the envelope down to the county clerk. On Thursday, guess what happened next? Glendora gets a nasty decision on the DHC William Street case. This decision is worse than the first one. Glendora has reason to believe that that secretary, uh, Jeanette, went to uh, the law clerk, his name is Howard Leitner, and told him what G uh, had said about her rudeness and that Leitner tells Jeanette to sit down at the typewriter and uh, say that Glendora's cross motion is denied and leave the date blank and Coppola will just sign it. A judge will sign anything that a law clerk puts under his nose. And there goes the $245 that Glendora paid to get this lawsuit into Supreme Court and $30,000 that Glendora asked for damages. Uh, you will read more about this. Uh, when Glendora's protest comes out next week that will be circulated all over the state of New York and it will be on television for you. An hour on DHCR today as Franklin looked over the Coppola file which Glendora found out the county clerk's office located. On Friday, Glendora made notes on the uh, nasty tempered secretary and law clerk and the grotesque so-called decision and order on William Street. Went to the county clerk's office and looked over the file and put everything in chronological order and made it a tidy pile and saw a note that somebody from the DHCR Bronx had been in to look over the file, probably getting ready to serve a copy of the signed order with a written notice of entry. Now, maybe the law clerk Leitner and the secretary Jeanette uh, got out of the nasty decision on William Street as a result of Glendora speaking her piece in the last week about the What Happened log, which they received Monday and Tuesday. That is when the decision was dated. It is a sick system, folks. They are like the DHCR in their operation, the Westchester County Supreme Court. This is another reason they rule like the DHCR, two peas in a pod of waste, confusion, and malfeasance with no recall of what their purpose is in the Supreme Court. Other than the DHCR and what you have just read, today's joke is Mary said, did you have a hard day at the courthouse, dear? And Peter said, yes, the computer broke down and I had to think. Time on the DHCR yesterday was one hour and a quarter, half an hour today bringing the what happened log up to date and writing down what to say in protest to the Capola's William Street uh, flimsy paper. Tomorrow videotape it for TV. When you get something like that, whether it makes you feel good or whether it makes you feel bad, you've got to have a blank piece of paper. 
and you got to have a pen. And on that paper, you have to, these thoughts come to you very, very quickly. And sometimes they leave never to come back. And you can't remember them. So you have your paper right there. And you write down what your thoughts are about that. I'll show you mine. It's pretty sloppy, but it will help when I come time to write my protest. These are the thoughts that went through my mind when the screwball paper came through. And you write them down. And then you sit down and you write your protest. Or you write down your joy. Uh, so members of the 1993 Sunday Communion, uh, the total time on uh, the DHCR this week was five and a half hour. And Bob has a key job at the county courthouse. It is his job to lock it up at night. But listen, you probably hear this in my protest, but I can't see what this is. It doesn't say decision and order. It does not say at the end, this is the order and decision of this court. What is it? What is this piece of paper? What is it? It's on October the 20th. Uh, just a county clerk, Honorable Matthew F. Capone. But what is it? It doesn't say up at the top in an order. It doesn't say at the bottom. This is the order and decision of this is the decision in this court. That's what happened on Glendora versus the DHCR on the week of November the first, nineteen ninety three. Folks, uh, what happened on Glendora versus Lydia Gallicano on the week of November first, nineteen ninety three? Ah, here it is. This is the appeal of Judge Holden's bad decision on the October and September rents of 1990. Uh, here, this will be my copy. This is the uh, appellant's brief. Remember that the record on appeal, on the appellate term, it doesn't cost you anything the way it costs you $250 on the appellate division. On the appellate term, it's an appeal of an action in uh, a town court or a village court or a city court. Uh, and uh, the village is an appeal what you call an original record, and the court sends in the record on appeal for you. You don't have to do that. All you have to do is to get together your briefs. Now, uh, so you have the affidavit of service by mail, and you have the statement pursuant to uh, Rule 5531, and that's very easy in the appellate term to fill out. Actually, it just tells you what the motions were and what the uh, papers were. And, you and that's a simple thing. Uh, that tells you uh, what's being appealed from the court and the county in which it's being appealed and who the opponent's attorney is. And uh, are you going to submit or argue your appeal? I'm going to argue it, oral argument. And uh, who filed the note of issue, Glendora, and the date it's filed is November 12, 1993. So, and then you have to send two, post, three, two postcards. One that will notify you when your oral argument and the other one is they send to the opponents. So I'm going to send one for John Ornberger, the son-in-law lawyer of Lydia Gallicano, to Lydia Gallicano and her husband Larry Gallicano. Now this is the, uh, these are the copies for the appellate term. The original, I'm going to give them the original, all the original papers, and I have to give them three copies. And the other papers that I showed you, okay. Stuff's going to be heavy in the mail. And then I will give uh, uh, two copies to the opponent, to John Ornberger, and then I'll give one copy to Lydia Gallicano. These are kind of pretty copies. I had these made early on with the red backs. And that's what happened with Glendora versus Lydia Gallicano on the week of November 1st, 1993. Uh, 
Philip Amicone, the building commissioner of White Plains, Alfred Del Vecchio, the mayor of White Plains and the White Plains Building Department on the week of November 1st, 1993. They're out. Del Vecchio was not reelected. And uh, the uh, brief, the appellant's brief that was sent to the clerk of the appellant's division down in Brooklyn. So I'll uh, read you this brief when it comes back, and I'm sure it's all right. So uh, Del Vecchio was not reelected. He lost the primary. And uh, I have said, uh, I think that this uh, really added up uh, the inefficiencies of the library, the White Plains Library, uh, the same of the uh, White Plains Building Department, the same of the White Plains uh, courts, the city courts, and uh, the same of the uh, White Plains Police Department. I think that it's time for a change and that these uh, departments uh, do the job that they're supposed to do in looking out for us, don't you? What happened on Glendale Vice President and Senior President of Network Sales, that would be Joseph Abersay and Peter Bond, Beth Bresson, Matthew Margo, and Matt Steinfeld. Uh, the record of appeal, I started it this week, and uh, it's just about done. We have yet to do the uh, uh, statement. What was the action of the case? The summons was and complaint, the answer which was a motion to dismiss, and my cross motion not to dismiss it but to pay the $120,000. There's a picture of Mr. Tish in it. It's a picture of Lawrence Tish. And uh, then the table of contents, and that will be done. And then that will go down to the appellate division for the clerks to look at to see if I did anything wrong. I'll save it for 90 days. I want to have to perfect copies. And that's what happened on Glendora versus CBS Inc. on the week of November 1st, 1993. Mailing number 32, 21 Greenridge Avenue. What happened the week of November 1st, 1993? Glendora versus Larkin. November 1st, Walsh and guest Patrick how to use cream cream for tonight's vandalism. This is Halloween. The three were outside the front door of Building A, and Glendora had to pass them to get into her home. At 5.10 p.m., there was a broken egg on the sill of the kitchen window with the contents drooling down the side of Building A. It was disgusting. Inside the hall, at the threshold of Glendora's door, there was another broken window and white all over the floor. Their mental sickness continues, reckless, wanton, juvenile, pathetic. The prime suspect is James Walsh. The What Happened, number 31 of last week, was copied, 23 copies, and posted. The cost was $20. Uh, November the 2nd, 1993, Monday, it took an hour to videotape the wall log for television, a half hour to transfer the audio tapes to videotape, and a quarter of an hour to videotape the eggs strewn all over the window shaving cream on the screen of the Southwest living room window, uh, right here. Uh, the egg and the shaving cream will stay there until the person who put them there cleans them up. The mess is disgusting, but these hoodlums would rather downgrade their domicile than upgrade it, and that is how degenerate they are. The number of harassments total 375. On November the 2nd, 1993, 11.55 a.m. voted. It is so convenient. It's right across the street at the Jewish Center. Monday was a day of peace, except for somebody taking a napkin and wiping the egg yolk off the floor and up over the door, up over the front of the door, three-quarters of the way up the door. 
uh, from the floor to the peephole. The prime suspect is Roberta Walsh, number 376. 749, I mean 7, 749 p.m., do the lawsuit for Monday, the log number 27. 9 p.m., Mondays is done. Now start Tuesdays, proofreading, correct number 28. The second week of October, the lawsuit is up to with 468 tortious acts. Uh, the time on wall today is two and a half hours, and IBM and Goodyear are going to merge so that they can manufacture a computer that makes snap decisions. Uh, November the 3rd, 1993, Wednesday, Marianne did a great job cleaning up the egg off the floor and the door. The person who put it there should have cleaned it up. Confess. Confess. Glendora was two hours logging videotapes, two Z and three B to show the police at 2 p.m. The lieutenant and officer were here from 2 p.m. to 2.50 p.m. looking at the horror of Walsh, El Pucci, and Larkin, Franklin, proofread, and corrected number 29. There was no time to do the other wall jobs four hours on wall. Franklin, proofread, and corrected number 30. There is just one more to go. The countdown ticks on. That took an hour. Pete was bragging that he had a plant manager job with IBM, and his mother-in-law says it's his job to water them. 12.26 p.m., write the lead in for numbers 29 and 30. Glendora successfully negotiated that deal with a Fortune 500 company to put her jokes on the NBC television network. The check is on the way. The time on wall today is two and a half hours so far, with four hours of editing to do this afternoon, which will equal six and a half hours. Ed gave up his job at Midas Muffer. He found out that it was too exhausting. Here is what the, was accomplished on the editing today. 13 Walsh chapter of 1331 a chat with Glendora Alpucci Larkin chapter 10 was finished the footage uh, off of the 8 millimeter tape 3B the old chapter 8 that the police have along with old chapters 5, 6, 7 the noise ordinance breaking of May and June and the aggravated harassment calls the archives VHS was made 1332 was laid down cleaned up no VHS archives chapter 11 the audio tapes transferred to videotape James Walsh and Patrick uh, Kevin Walsh, class of Bob and Dorian A. Hallway, who is the new detective. 1333, uh, the first 20 minutes laid down. Diane Williams will not need the three-quarter inch dubs. Egg on the floor, egg on the door, egg on the window, shaving cream on the window, guess who. Uh, November the 5th, 1993, Friday, seven hours Franklin and seven hours Glendora today on wall, editing in Manhattan. The cost was $160 it cost to edit those videotapes. The purchase of eight new three-quarter inch videotapes was $75. The toll was $1.75. What got done? 1332 VHS archive, chapter 11, 1333 finish uh, the audio tapes that were on videotape, clean it up, VHS, 1334, the first 10 minutes laid down and then finished all the wall footage for the past seven months. All of the wall footage, videotape footage, from April to November is done. It's up to date. It's ready to go on the cable TV. It's ready to be televised. That big wall editing job is done. There was no cleanup of Chapter 13 and no VHS until the next 20 minutes is laid down. This frees up time to start laying down Glendora, reading the What Happened logs and get them edited and get them ready to be televised. Now the time on wall today is 14 hours. There was no time to work on the lawsuit. Mary, what kind of a day did you have at the office, dear? Peter, it was awful. My computer broke and I had to think. November the 6th, 1993, Saturday, four hours burned up on labeling, filing, planning, the wall videotape, sorting them out and scheduling them and planning what to edit this Thursday. Glendora called John Porzio yesterday to tell him she would not be able to come and see him because of the Manhattan trip. Poor Mary Ann had to work so hard to clean up the egg off the threshold and off the door. The egg on the window is still there. The shaving cream is still there. The fire department at 7.40 a.m. was here. There was somebody in the back. There were six pieces of apparatus. It, uh, they were here less than 10 minutes, and Glendora videotaped all the excitement. You'll see it on TV. No torts since number 375 Sunday. 1.30 p.m., do the wall lawsuit for Friday. Number 31, what happened? Insert, Candy Alpucci's sister blew her horn twice on November the 
25th, 93, Friday at 7.20 a.m. Nella Alpucci blew her horn once the same day, one minute later. Glendora fasted for two days. It is nice to exercise the discipline. No letters have been returned this week. The count of uh, harassments and law breaking so far is 378 since April 1993. 2.30 p.m. Check the CPLR for service upon an infant. Uh, in this lawsuit,